Well, as ever, I bid you a good morning to orient you. We're now in Luke 10, where the 72 have been out on mission. We've pointed out a few differences from chapter 9, when Jesus did more or less the same with his inner circle of 12. But now the 72 have returned cock hoop and Jesus is thrilled too. However, he adds an important reality check. It's very, very easy for us to get ahead of ourselves. We saw that quite recently in the reaction of Peter, James and John after returning from the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus needs to ground them and to give them heaven's perspective. Don't get too excited, he says, by the rather fearful and subordinate response of demons at the mention of Jesus's name. Instead, save your real rejoicing for the biggest deal of all, that your names are written in heaven. Now, I think it's worth stepping back a little and doing a quick panoramic sweep of, of scripture because the book of life features from Moses right the way through Revelation and you might want to look up some of these references. The first clear mention is Exodus chapter 32 verses 32 and 33. And the context here is the golden calf incident. Moses comes down Mount Sinai, he's carrying two stone tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments to find the Israelites in a pagan orgy, worshipping the golden calf, which they reckon had done all sorts of miracles and pulled off the biggest rescue mission the world had ever seen, not Yahweh. 3,000 people died that day. Moses went back up the mountain for a crisis meeting with God and he puts himself on the line. But now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you've written. And the Lord replied to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. The nature of the book of life at this point is not entirely clear. It could be poetic equivalent of the land of the living, but it could be more. So let's re move on and read the next reference, which is Psalm 69, which is one of several remarkable prophetic psalms speaking partly of King David and his enemies and then blurring into a description of the sufferings of Messiah Jesus, seen as through frosted glass. Read down to verses 27 and 28. Speaking of his enemies, the psalmist writes, Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. This seems to be more than a request for their death. This blotting out means that they are ineligible for salvation, which by implication only the righteous will inherit. Moving on to the New Testament, we find Jesus referring to this same book of life here in Luke 10. But keep going. In Philippians 4 verse 3, Paul mentions in passing that Clement and other co-workers have their names written in the book of life. But it's when you get to Revelation, the last book of the Bible, that the book of life comes into its own. It's mentioned no less than six times. And to sum up, it's imperative that at our death that our names are written in that book because anyone whose name is not found is destined for the lake of fire. Now I refuse to gloss over any scripture but I do want to finish with an encouragement and actually it's from the lips of Jesus again to the church in Sardis and he tells them the one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white, 
and I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life. But I will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Victorious. That's the qualification. Who are these victors? What are the victors over? Well, this is victory in a war against sin. So, as per that letter to Sardis, let's avoid staining our clothes, staining our white robe, the one that Jesus gave us when we came to him at all costs. Anything you need to enforce victory over, grace and peace to you and yours. Thank you.